This week on the Computer Chronicles, the conclusion of our special three-part series on the European Technology Roundtable and Exhibition. We'll tell you why analysts here think Europe is the next big internet bull market. We'll tell you about the newest developments in the mobile internet. And we'll show you the latest in wireless technology. It's all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. Whether we're talking about e-commerce or email, it seems pretty clear here at this e-conference in Prague that the world is going wireless, and the exciting future platform for almost all things internet will be your cell phone or your PDA. Launch which was in roughly November. Erwin Jacobs is CEO of Qualcomm, one of the leaders in cell phone technology. Jacobs says that wireless may be a better broadband solution than wired technologies like DSL or cable. The secret to mobile broadband is something called HDR, high data rate, squeezing more bits into the same bandwidth. What we realize is by properly optimizing the radio links for internet data that we could get very high data rates even in the one and a quarter megahertz bandwidth. We don't have to go to wider bandwidths and there's a lot of cost savings if you don't have to do that and a great deal more flexibility. And so although originally we thought you had to go to five megahertz and most other people are pursuing wider bandwidth, we demonstrated that you get these very high data rates in the one and a quarter megahertz bandwidth. And so it makes it very economic. We've now completed a standard. We've uh, completed the first version of the chips and now people are out there getting ready for commercial application. What this all means is that you may soon get flat rate web access on your cell phone and that your mobile phone could be able to handle new kinds of applications. The simplest one perhaps is the idea of downloading music and listening to music and you'll be able to do that very rapidly in a few seconds using the HDR technology. So, so your friend calls you says, have you heard such and such? If you haven't, it's at such and such a URL. You'll press a button, download, begin to listen to it. Call them back and say, boy, that was wonderful. There are other approaches to bringing higher bandwidth to today's cell phones. One is from a company called BlueKite. For the service provider, what BlueKite software does is it provides uh, optimization of the transmission of data over their wireless spectrum. So it improves the transmission of data by a factor of eight, which means that they can have eight times as many people on a given spectrum or pipe, and that they can do it at one-eighth the cost. So that's very attractive to them. For the end user, uh, the byproduct of this network optimization, transmission of data, is improved speed on accessing the mobile internet via a mobile device like a laptop or a pocket PC. So a user can expect to get five times performance improvement on their mobile device over what they would get without a BlueKite enabled service. It's not only companies like BlueKite and Qualcomm that see wireless as the next big trend. ComTouch CEO Isabel Maxwell also thinks that the mobile internet is the future of the web. So the trend for mobile and wireless is absolutely essential. There are six, 500 million subscribers, mobile subscribers now in, in the world. And the reason why it's going to grow exponentially is because you don't have to have the connectivity of the pipes and the telephone lines. And the digital divide globally will be helped that way. Most people are going to actually access the internet and email from a cell phone, from a, from a mobile device, for the very reason that it's much less expensive and it's truly mobile. So that's a very major trend. There are problems, of course, with the wireless net, the main one being security. The problem is that once your information is in the ether rather than in wires, it is even easier to steal. In fact, Symantec is coming out with new security software to protect infrared communications between Palm pilots. We have in fact created the first virus scanning engine that resides on the Palm itself. So it resides on the Palm and allows you to deal with the problem as you send files over the infrared connection from Palm to Palm and that is a prototype device that's available in beta version on our website and I would encourage people to go pull it down and play with it because it's a really, really thoughtful piece of code. 
But despite the problems with wireless security, mobile devices have one big advantage over wired PCs. They know where you are. And the position knowledge of mobile devices can lead to totally new kinds of applications. First of all, there's the emergency use. If there's emergency, you want to be able to pinpoint exactly where that phone is. GPS enhanced as we do it with the phone allows that to occur. And then there's a whole set of applications that will take advantage of knowing position information. And so we think that's going to open up a whole set of other businesses. Well, the one I mentioned at my talk was a chat room type where uh, uh, you, you provide a capability that you walk into the shopping center, it identifies which of your friends are in the area, allows you to communicate and perhaps meet up with them if you wish. Of course you don't need to if you have your phone available. Not only are cell phones being touted as the future of voice communications and web surfing, some are even saying the cell phone will become the primary platform for email. And that means a growing market for new hosted email services. The reason it's important to have email on their site is because, as IDC says, 76% of all activity on the internet today is email related. So if you don't have email, which is the prime way of communicating with your end users, whether you're selling them a service, information, commerce, content, community, whatever, they're going away to somebody else's site. So why should you see the real estate email, email space to the likes of Yahoo or AOL when you can have it on your own site and people have to come to your site to get their email? And they do. So it drives traffic and brand and revenues. Email is also becoming a more popular and profitable target for new online marketing efforts. This is David Wetherill, CEO of the internet conglomerate CMGI. And then we have an a, a, a opt-in email company called YesMail, which has 13 million people uh, who have, believe it or not, subscribed to get more email. <laughs> they just aren't getting enough. And, uh, but w these people, they ask for email by certain subject areas of information they're interested in. And we're getting amongst the highest CPM rates in the world uh, for these names. It's about $193 CPM currently. And that's rising. It got down to 185. It's been as high as 213. And that, that, com that compares to a $3 to $5 CPM on average for a lot of the portals. Email clients will also be getting more intelligent. Qualcomm's new Eudora email program has what could be a very valuable feature for impulsive emailers. It's called a mood watcher. It checks your email to see if it has any strong words or vocabulary that you might want to think a second time before you actually send that email. So it, 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 it checks it, has an algorithm and vocabulary to see whether that's something you might want to think about twice. It may be a little bit playful at the present time, although people get a chuckle from it, but uh, it could be, end up being a useful capability. It certainly has gotten a lot of attention. One big problem in doing email on your cell phone is input. Who wants to type a paragraph on a cell phone keypad? Well, it appears you won't have to. Think outside, the makers of the stowaway keyboard for the Palm Pilot are hinting vaguely but strongly that their next product will be a portable keyboard for your cell phone. We're working with a number of the major handheld companies and uh, wireless companies uh, to add uh, value to some of the products that they're working on and create products that take advantage of our expertise of, of uh, very small uh, devices that can fold to fit in your pocket. So uh, we think there will be new uh, appliances, new devices that will ca you'll carry with you and be able to access the internet or do email from anywhere, anytime, anyplace. The bottom line here is that the cell phone may well become the dominant network computing device that some have been predicting. Now Larry Ellison had for many years talked about the network appliance and he envisioned a computer that didn't have a hard disk perhaps, was stripped down but always connected to the net. That indeed is the telephone. And so the thing he missed was that it's already coming to us as a telephone. That will be indeed that wireless, that, that uh, network appliance. One good example of a web-based phone as a network appliance is this telephone called the Pingtel. It not only uses voice over IP, it actually is a telephone that runs Java and can do things no old-fashioned phone could ever do. We've got things like presence applications where when you go off hook, there's a client that sends a notification to Microsoft's instant messenger service so that all the people who are in your buddy list know that you're on the phone and in your office. 
We have people doing games. We have uh, a little thing that allows you to insert a uh, audio editorial remark into a phone call that you have, like a, uh, a uh, clap or a laugh or a raspberry, you know, you can in the middle of a phone call if you'd like. So, uh, you know, any, anything and everything is what happens when you get an open platform that's a phone. Doesn't matter, somebody has an idea, there's an application for it. The power of the ping telephone is that it acts wrote. like a computer are, and can be programmed to provide different services. You have a telephone today that's connected to a phone jack that connects to your PBX. And all of the stuff that your phone can do today is defined by what your PBX tells you it can do. It's a bit like when you had a VT100 on your desk and there was a VAX mainframe in the other room. You kind of did what it told you you could do and that was it. Compare that computing model to when you have a PC on your desk if you find a piece of software you like, if it's a sales management software or something, you load it on your PC and it talks to the network as is appropriate. What we've done is do the same thing to the phone. Pingtel is trying to follow the Palm Pilot model by encouraging a large community of software developers to create applications for Pingtel and establish it as an IP telephony standard. The platform is based on something called SIP, SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. Anything in SIP is really a URL. So when you dial a phone number, it's actually represented inside the phone as SIP colon 555112 at somedomain.com. But it could also be jbatson at pingtel.com. So if someone has a SIP phone, a Pingtel phone or another SIP phone, and wants to call me at my SIP number or at my SIP URL, they simply use whatever interface their phone provides. And in our case, you do it through your PC. You simply type jbatson at pingtel.com on the web browser that's on your PC and it causes your phone to dial my phone across the internet completely over IP end to end. So you're calling me not at my phone number but at my SIP URL. It's not only small startups that are pursuing the voice over IP telephony market, 3Com is also getting into the internet telephone business focused initially on the small business market. Very few homes today have four PBXs. But all small businesses need a PBX to handle voice traffic. Small businesses today are ready to adopt land telephony. In fact, we're seeing an, an explosive growth in this market. We helped invent the market. Uh, we think we have the best product and the, the largest market share in this market. It's going to be one of the engines of growth of the, of the new 3Com. Over time, we fully expect IP telephones to also be used inside consumers, in, in consumer environments and uh, digital homes. But for the time being, the primary focus is small, medium-sized business. While Americans tend to be more serious about telephony, in Japan and Scandinavia, they seem to have more fun with their phones. This is a company from Finland called Akamiti, which is a kind of Napster for cell phones. Log on to their website and download your favorite song as a cell phone ring. You can even add little animated graphics. The dominant topic here at Etra was the stock market, the falling fortunes of some dot-com entrepreneurs and predictions about the future. The irony here was that the weakness in the stock market has in fact led to new strength in the private venture capital markets. Venture capital has raised more money this year than last year. We have seen more than 30 funds which have been created with above one billion dollars. This is the first time in history where there's so much money in venture capital. But last year there was much more money in entrepreneurs than there was money in venture capital. This year there's much more money in venture capital than money for entrepreneurs. This is a very different situation. Another lesson learned from the recent high-tech market adjustment is that even if you're in the new economy, it still takes time to build a successful company. One of the great lessons of the internet is that you know we got into like speed like we all have to you know conquer uh, you know Mount Everest on day one well the reality is is as Steve Jobs always says these overnight successes take a long time at uh, newsweek.msnbc.com we think that the numbers the metrics as we call them are very important you have to keep track of how much you spend you have to keep track of how much you earn Profitability, though, may not be the best metric short term. Because really, if you think your business is going to continue to grow, you should take what you might make in profits and reinvest it. So for us, uh, 
actually at this point we think it's more important to show that we can grow revenues and keep expenses under control. For a lot of web businesses, it may turn out that they become profitable when they decide to become profitable. In other words, once there's no more room to invest, you begin to harvest profits. There was lots of talk here at Etra about new investment opportunities outside the United States, with more VC interest than ever before in the European high-tech market. Well, most of the growth is occurring outside the U.S. Uh, still, most of the revenue is coming from within the U.S. Uh, growth in numbers of users is outside the U.S. Uh, growth in revenues is inside the U.S., uh, but that's shifting too. Uh, Europe is the fastest growing, I think, right now uh, area outside the U.S., uh, but Asia uh, will be taking that over in the next few years. So despite the market doldrums in the U.S., there was no shortage of interest or money for high-tech investment in Europe. During this week of this conference, we've seen essentially the NASDAQ uh, melt down, uh, getting into uh, reaching its lowest level in almost over a year. Uh, yet, uh, when we're talking about European venture capital, it seems like there's just money everywhere. Uh, although I don't think that uh, there's really much of an interest anymore in pure uh, e-media companies or e-commerce companies and a lot of the money seems to be angling uh, towards uh, telecommunications, services and infrastructure. One factor driving optimism in Europe is the move toward mobile internet platforms and Europe's clear lead in cell phone technology and applications. I think the, the fact that there are so many European companies here, so many little startups, many of them in wireless, but also a lot of them in other infrastructure areas, uh, really shows how global the internet is becoming. A couple of years ago, we never would have seen this. Everything was happening in the United States. But now, and especially because Europe has a lead in wireless, we're seeing Europe, in fact, taking the lead in a lot of the stuff. But greed may be slowing down the growth of the mobile technology sector in Europe. And we've recently had these gigantic auctions for Spectrum in Europe for the 3G next generation or next and a half generation wireless technology, which everyone believes is a really important technology. And everyone also seems to believe that the governments got greedy and they set up those auctions in such a way that people paid too much and the companies were stupid enough to pay too much and now they've, they've got these licenses that they are going to have a really hard time making pay. The consequence of high wireless spectrum fees here may mean that Europe could lose its lead in wireless technology. And it either will result in those systems never being deployed because it won't be affordable for the companies or systems being deployed with prices for the end consumer that are too expensive in order to pay off the, 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 de the debt that was incurred in order to buy the spectrum. And I just chaired a panel about with a bunch of investment bankers a minute ago, and, and one of them was saying, several of them agreed with this too, that it could mean that Europe loses its lead in wireless communications. What was also interesting here at Etra was that high-tech competition for American companies is now coming from new parts of the world, not just Europe and Asia. We're starting to see other countries come into the mix. And I was thinking today, for example, that uh, Gil Schwed, who's the president of Checkpoint Software from Israel, I remember five or six years ago when he came here, it was sort of a novelty. There's someone from Israel. And of course now Gil Schwed is the Steve Jobs of Israel. He's a rock star there. And it's a huge, important company. And this year we see venture capitalists here who specialize in India, who specialize in Russia. And I think five years from now, we're going to be very surprised to see powerful, new, internationally influential companies coming from places like India. That's going to be interesting to watch. Perhaps the one foreign country with the greatest influence here was Israel. Sixteen Israeli companies were in attendance at Etra, most of them involved in Internet security solutions. There's a kind of a reason for the, the strong reputation of Israeli technology is that many, many people, it's a, hist it's a function of its history and its legacy because unfortunately Israel since its inception has been a country mostly at war, or ma many times at war. So all the adult men and women have basically spent time in the military and the military, the intelligence and the 
the capabilities that they learn whilst in the military, they bring with them when they come outside, when they finish their military service. And that is why, and, and richly deserve the reputation of Israel as being a strong technology, strong technology uh, birthplace, if you like, is, is, is the right one, and why our company is a very good example of it. Well, I was in the army, and I think the reason that you say that no, so many Israeli people have military background, because we've all been in the army, and many of the people that are uh, that are leading in the high-tech sector also did that in the, when they served in the army. So when they served in the army, they were good in technology, they did that in the army, they did that after. So I've started in computers when I was 10. I was professional when I was 15. When I got to the army, I dealt with, with technology and computer as well. And after the army, I've continued that. So, I mean, it, it was another, and obviously any place that I spent four years that they an influence on my career and on what I know. Oddly enough, one of the reasons Israel has become such an important global high-tech player is because it is such a small country. I think there is a few reasons. One is the fact that Israel is uh, uh, are focusing on global market. I mean, we cannot focus on the local market. So if you want to create something real, like real company in the technology world, you have to focus on the, on the faraway market, on a big market, which is the difference between a company that, let's say, established in a small city in Europe or in the States. We cannot focus on the local market, it's too small. Gil Shwed is CEO of Checkpoint Software, one of the most successful Israeli high-tech startups. The company is now traded on the NASDAQ and has a market cap of $25 billion. Gil Shwed says one of the reasons for these kinds of success stories in Israel is because the country itself was run like a startup. The main reason is that Israel is a very entrepreneurial entrepreneurial uh, spirit and that comes from the founding of the country which wasn't a high-tech uh, startup but it was like a startup people that have a goal that they must achieve that goes against most odds that they have limited resources and they have to be innovative and creative to make it successful and if you look at the history of Israel for the past hundred years before this country started and after it was mostly that luckily enough for us in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, the military or the, uh, the defense situation became such that people can shift their attention from survival to creativity and to take that to other spaces. And I think that's what's happening. A good example of Israeli military technology applied to civilian purposes is flyover, an Israeli startup that is taking aerial surveillance technology out of war and into day-to-day -day life. Flyover is developing aerial mapping capabilities to replace today's online navigation tools such as MapQuest. Instead of looking at maps of where you want to go, Flyover shows you actual aerial photos of what you're looking for. And they are using very powerful compression techniques, which they say will even let them send aerial map images to your PDA or cell phone. Several other foreign companies were also showing off interesting new web-based products. From France, Kaidara demonstrated a new kind of shopping assistant that acts more like a search engine. Even if it can't find exactly what you're looking for, it will find the next best thing and make intelligent recommendations for substitutes. A German company called Inquire showed off this easy-to-use 3D modeling tool, designed to make it possible for even novices to create 3D product images for use in online catalogs. And an Australian company called World Lingo was offering this new web-based language translation service which will automatically translate your website into another language, making it easier to sell your products into foreign markets. There were certainly lots of alarms going off at this ETRA conference, concerns about privacy, security, consumer e-commerce, and the stock market. But the overall mood here was surprisingly optimistic, with most industry leaders saying that the market adjustment was over and that the fundamentals of the Internet economy are still sound. I think the consensus is that the fundamentals of the Internet are very sound, very healthy still and that the market is uh, in what people are calling a correction. Uh, so there isn't a lot of uh, panic among the dot-com guys. They're pretty optimistic that, that this is going to bottom out pretty soon and they'll come back. Well, what happened with, uh, with the stock market? I think that you know, uh, uh, you know, investors got scared of a lot of these concept companies, not 
being able to differentiate the winners from the losers, and so they indiscriminately pulled their money out of the sector. Uh, and you know, those that have enough runway are going to be, uh, uh, you know, the long-term winners. Uh, and then eventually, the investors I think will learn better uh, how to pick the winners from the losers too. There's a lot of opportunity right now, but there's a lot of risk. Um, I see a lot of people going into uh, 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 safe investments like bonds, muni bonds, treasury bonds, even gold is looking interesting for the first time in probably 800 years. So there's some risk. There's always opportunity when there's risk. I guess I would, I would ask, what is going to shake the tech market out of this slump? I have no idea. Well, after all of this, if you are still trying to figure out where we are on the timeline of the Internet revolution, I'd say the overwhelming view here at Etra was this is act one, scene one of a three-act play, still very much a work in progress, with the final outcome far from clear. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffe at the Etra conference in Prague in the Czech Republic. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-888. 310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic.